Hi there, this is a walkthrough of the um, tool that American Farmland Trust made for the Conservation Fund um, for estimating avoided greenhouse gas emissions from an agricultural conservation easement on the Bishop Farm in East Peoria, Tazewell County, Illinois, USA. Um, there's a bunch of tabs on the bottom. This first one is README. It has some information and links to the quantitative method from CARB. Uh, makes a note that we made some uh, modifications based on data availability. And it gives the link to where we'll have the um, full report posted that walks you through step by step the spreadsheet and the calculations as well. Um, so briefly, you have tab one here that's inputs. Tab two, that's equations, and then three summarizes all the results and looks nice and neat and tidy. Um, Comet Farm is a great tab to look at as well. It has the uh, tables that show up in the report and the graphs from the report are there as well. Just wanted to be sure to mention that. So if we start with inputs, um, this is the first part of the uh, CARB quantification methodology. I'm starting on page nine there, we're using the 2020 methodology. There is a 2022 update, uh, but yeah, so also check that out. Um, but so the first part of the process is figuring out the number of development rights extinguished by the easement. Um, and so these are uh, mostly referred to in here as dwelling units is kind of the, the number that's used. And there's a decision tree to walk through um, to figure out the number of dwelling units that would potentially be developed on the easement site. Um, so we walk through a couple of areas here. So gray cells are a calculation, so you don't want to type in those. The blue ones are uh, reference values that we've entered, uh, information that we've found, and green cells are values to report out. So um, we start with the number of, uh, do we know the number of dwelling units stated in a zoning proposal for the site? We don't have that, so um, that would be one way to go if we had that. And um, will the area be developed as residential or rural residential? Um, this is residential. Then the remaining steps follow um, the decision tree for uh, areas at risk of residential conversion. There is a second decision tree in the quantitative quantification methodology for rural residential conversion. Um, and that's basically uh, easement sites that are farther from an urban area. So following the residential area conversion, um, risk of residential conversion, we assess the parcel size that was from the parcel data we got from Taysville County. We checked what the um, slope was. We didn't have to worry about that. Um, we needed to find the area or the, yeah, the areas with the newest built structures, homes, um, for the calculation in this decision tree. And so as a proxy for that, we looked at the census tracts, which gives the, um, year of that average year that structures were built. So we have a tab here, census track year structure built. Um, and these are their different tracks uh, containing the farm and surrounding the farm. And they give you the number of structures um, built and then they give you totals um, by uh, year. So 2014 or later, those are the newest ones. Uh, then they are break it, broken up into different years. So you can see how many in that census track. And so back to tab one, we went with um, the newest area was census tract 215. Um, the only one that had housing units built in 2014 or later. 
Um, then we selected the acre zoned as low density residential from Tazewell County zoning layer. Within that, um, select existing residential structures. So 665 is the number of residential structured structures. Um, then we calculate the dwelling units per acre from this. So basically the um, number of uh, structures divided by the acres there to get um, an idea of what the density is likely to be, the housing density is likely to be if this farm area was developed for low-density low residential. Again, um, we have the, the property site area is about 103 acres. And so using this density on 103 acres means there's about 74 dwelling units or households that would go into the farm. And that's what we use for the rest of the calculations because they're all based on per dwelling unit for the most part. Then we figure out the um, population density for the tract and if it's currently zoned as rural or urban according to the census. Then following in the, the quantitative methodology, you determine the project soil type. Uh, you can follow along. They have really clear steps here. Sorry, it's after the decision trees. Here, where they walk you through how to use the soil web tool for your site and then to get the um, soil type. And then you have a drop down here to choose what kind um, you find there. So we're an alpha soil. And then this automatically generates based on what you put in here. It generates um, the IPCC soil type. Um, and that tells us later on we have this soil organic carbon reference. Based on the USDA soil type, translating that to an IPCC soil type, then there's an, a reference carbon stock, um, which is pretty uh, rough way of estimating soil organic carbon, but for doing lots of easements, um, that's kind of a simplified way, reasonable way to do it. And then we need the zip code for the parcel. Um, we use that to look up the power grid emissions information. Um, and I will just pull that up really quickly. It's called the EPA Power Profiler. And you put in the zip code. So here it's 61611. Go. And we are in the SRMW grid, and it gives us CO2 emissions, um, pounds of SO2 and NOx per megawatt hour. It compares the different sources of energy to the national average. So that's all this cool stuff you can look at that's not completely relevant here, but cool tool. Uh, we'll mention that again later. So those are the inputs. That's what you kind of need to put in in order to run this tool. So then in equations, again, we have um, gray calculated value, uh, reference value that is needed um, from you, from a reference um, data set. And then green is something that's going to come out uh, and be something worth reporting. And again, those are all pulled together in this nice results tab. So back in equations, it goes through, there's eight equations in, if we go back to the quantification method. So starting on page 19 here, you have this overall equation one, pardon the barking, if you can hear my dog barking. Um, so this equation one is what we'll come back to once we have calculated these four terms. I can make that a little bigger. So we're going to calculate these four terms. Um, and so you can see in the tool what the in the methodology, what the actual equation is there. Um, we've worked it out into a spreadsheet. So for equation two, you um, need to figure out equations three and four first. Um, so you can see here, this is equation two. 
And these two terms come from equations three and equation four. So equation three and four are um, getting the vehicle miles traveled or VMT for development on the agricultural land. And then due to the easement, meaning what would the vehicle miles traveled be if those same number of housing units were developed um, as infill or in a smart growth scenario um, with more efficient um, energy and transportation use per household. So um, the this methodology from California, they have some really cool data sets in order to, to calculate this. Not all states have that. Um, so we had to improvise a bit. So what we did was we found the average daily vehicle miles of travel in Tazewell County. Um, and this is referring to MPG refs. So there's a tab over here, MPG refs, where we've pasted in um, various data that we're pulling from. Um, and here I have by year, the average daily vehicle miles traveled for Tazewell County. Um, and we took the average of that and excluded 2020 and 2021, because you can see those are um, much lower <laughs> than the numbers above it. So we're just using the average of these years, 2012 through 2019. And if we go back to the equation, so here's that average, um, and then convert that to annual to go with the calculations. Then we had to divide up how many of those miles are coming from the urban parts of the county and the uh, rural parts of the county. So what we did was Illinois provides at a state level the proportion of annual vehicle miles traveled um, from urban and rural um, areas for the state. Um, and that was the best we could do. That also comes from MPG refs see if i can find it exactly over here where we've calculated um percentages over here for rural and urban uh, and here's the link to the illinois travel statistics it's a report they put out every year. So we use that to uh, say that represents Tazewell County. It's rough. That's the best um, way we could come up with with the data available. So then when we proportion out the uh, 1.2 billion annual miles for the county, we purport use these proportions for how much are coming from urban and how much are coming our, our rural miles. Then we look, we know that some of those miles are from passenger vehicles and some are commercial vehicles. Um, and we're working with housing units, so we're mainly interested in miles traveled from passenger vehicles. So that state report and that tab that I just pointed you to also has this um, proportion of the state vehicle miles traveled by passenger vehicles, so about 88%. So we take 88% of both of these weighted estimates down here those are and then we also put in the number of housing units urban housing units and number of rural housing units from the 2010 decennial census and that was the most recent um, census data available uh, and again we're we're noting even here that that's an imperfect way of partitioning miles between households um, but so so basically we need to take these total miles for an area and get a per household um, number of miles. So that's what we have these numbers of households. And then we divide them to get estimated vehicle miles traveled per urban household in Tazewell County and per rural household. Um, then we take that. Um, per household estimate, and we multiply it times uh, that 74 households, which is what we estimated would be developed in this scenario for Bishop Farm. So that's the, as you can see, as we've gone through here, I've just been doing urban and rural right next to each other. 
Um, so this is for equation three, this is for equation four. So it's just referenced down here. Then we can go back to equation two up here. And um, this number comes from the um, just the number, the difference. So you take the difference between um, rural versus urban. Um, so that would be, these are the miles that would be driven with development. These are the miles that would be driven with an infill scenario instead. And the difference between the two is the benefit of the conservation easement. And we multiply it times 30 because the method uses 30 years in as a time period for their estimates. So that's the miles avoided. Now we need to convert that to greenhouse gases. And what that means is we need to estimate miles per gallon per year um, for 2022 for 2052. So this refers to a tab um, called MPG and average efficiency emission factors by year. So that one is over here. And this is where we have um, measured data and uh, California has this data for the state, if not by county, um, but the best we could find to apply to Illinois was national data. Um, and so we have 2007 to 2020, and this is the miles per gallon for light duty vehicles uh, with short wheelbase, so passenger cars, et cetera, and then light duty vehicles with long wheelbase, so pickup trucks and SUVs that are longer. They have different miles per gallon. And uh, what this number is, is it takes into account the distribution of ages of vehicles on the road and um, estimates the average miles per gallon of all of, if we average among all the vehicles on the road. Um, and down below, um, there's a note that, uh, just that I confirmed that. And so then we have the slope and intercept of these measured data. So against the years, how is this uh, e efficiency increasing over time? Because we want to account for that going into the future as best we can. And then um, these data use the um, slope and intercept and the year to project forward, extrapolate um, a value. So you see the efficiency goes um, up to about 28 as the average for 2051. Um, so these are the years we're interested in. 30 years is 2022 to 2051. Um, then we are taking that average miles per gallon. Um, and we're turning it into ga gallons per mile and we're multiplying it times a value from this MPG refs. And what that is, is the um, grams of CO2E per gallon for gasoline. Um, the vast majority of passenger vehicles are gasoline, so we didn't worry about um, diesel emissions. So that's what that number is. We were in this tab. So then that gives us grams of CO2 equivalents per mile. And in the equations tab, we walk through what the miles uh, per year are um, for the scenario. So for those 74 households, we have those, we just brought those in, those values in here. And then we take the that uh, emission factor times those miles to get grams of CO2 from the easement. So it's the difference between these two miles converted into CO2 now that we know what the miles and the gallons would be. Then we need to um, sum all of these to get our 30 year estimate. And that is what this one is. So you see it's calling column I. This is column I. So it's summing all those to see what the 30 year benefit is. 
and um, that's in grams. So we are reporting it here. We just we converted grams to metric tons. And um, so that's where that number comes from. So now um, we have the greenhouse gas benefit from vehicle miles traveled. So that that's the first term that will be summed in when we come back to equation one. And that's the most complicated. So you made it through that. Um, you're you're going to be OK. So we did equations three and four. Now we're doing the benefit from reduced future electrical use. And um, so for that equation, let's look at it in the method equation five. We have an emission factor for the electricity usage, and then we need to know how much electricity is being used in the two different scenarios. Multiply times the number of households times 30 years, basically what we're going to do. So um, I showed you the power profiler. Excuse me here. Got my screen under control. So I showed you the power profiler, and that's what this emission rate um, of CO2 per megawatt hour of electricity. And then we convert that to um, this is in pounds. We want it in tons. So this is the conversion factor for that. So now we have our emission factor in tons of CO2e per megawatt hour. Then we pull um, from the, let's go to, so from the BTU tab here, um, this is coming from the Energy Information Administration and um, go down below here. It's their. Um, they have a, a survey um, that they do, and so that allows them to do. Um, their estimates. I think it's residential energy consumption. Supply or something like that. Anyway, um, so this is the table and um, for electricity use, we're pulling this urban number and this rural number. Into our equation, so that's what these are here. So that's telling us per uh, year what the average dwelling unit uh, megawatt hours are for those two different kinds of homes. Um, and so that accounts for more efficient uh, housing, more compact. Um, there uh, in the in the urban infill scenario. Then we just convert that energy use into tons of CO2 and multiply it times the um, number of households times 30 years. And that gives us the second term that we're going to sum up in equation one. Great. Equation six is emission reductions from natural gas use. So the idea being that in rural areas, some homes use propane, which is a dirtier fuel, has more emissions per unit energy. So accounting for the urban homes using all natural gas. We have an emission factor. Um, the And these come from the Quantitative quantification methodology has an emission factor database that I have linked to. Excuse me. Here, this was updated in November, November 30th, so pretty recently, and, and we've updated the spreadsheet for that. So this is the emission factor for um, propane. And then we have the emission factor for natural gas, and I can show you what that looks like in the methodology. So the for rural sites, we're using a propane emission factor. And for the urban project scenario, we use the natural gas emission factor. So we're going to get the difference from those times how much natural gas an urban home uses. Which is going to have us going back to that REX survey. So that BTU tab. We're going to pull this natural gas use by urban uh, per urban home, so million BTU per household using fuel. OK, so we have that's where that's coming from. These emission factors for propane and natural gas, they come from this California database. They're um, going to be standard wherever you are. You burn propane. This is how much CO2 you're going to get for the most part. Um, OK, so then we just 
plug and chug, as my math teacher used to say. So we get the difference in the scenario um, so that we have this different um, emission factor, emission factor for the difference times the amount of natural gas that is used in an urban home times the number of households times 30 years. This will be the third um, number that is totaled in equation one. And the fourth term, the last term for equation one comes from avoided carbon loss of farmland due to conversion housing. And so that's basically estimating how much soil carbon um, is there and would be lost. And these are values. So this one comes from, um, from the, the methodology equation seven and has this 30% um, unitless land use factor representing the loss of soil carbon with conversion to settlements. This 88 came from, we looked up the input here. We have this and we have our soil organic carbon reference. And so we got the 88 from there and that's being pulled in here, converting the carbon from this to CO2 equivalents using this number, converting from hectares to acres, and um, the maximum number of acres per dwelling unit, dwelling disturbed by development. So acres per dwelling unit here. Um, and that's a number that they give you the, the um, equation has using either whichever is smallest, three or the um, project site divided by the households. Um, which is that 103. So in the ultimate equation, um, we have this unitless number times the 88 converted to CO2, um, converted to acres, um, multiplied times, yeah, so that's that converting to acres, one over A74. And then we have that part where we're gonna take the minimum. Um, so if uh, the acres divided by households is less than three, use acres divided by households, if not use three and multiplying it times the number of households. That does not get multiplied times 30 years because it's not happening every 30 years, it's just happening once for the easement. So that gives us the greenhouse gas benefit of soil organic carbon um, in tons of CO2 equivalents. And then after all of that, we can go back up to equation one, which sums those four numbers together to give us 19,500 tons of CO2 equivalents over 30 years of the easement. The methodology goes on to estimate the air pollution, the non-greenhouse gas air pollution co-benefit that also comes from reducing vehicle miles traveled and reducing electricity use. And this is calculated, about that, this is calculated also in that MPG and average emission factors by year. So up here at the top of that tab, we've got equation two business going on, and then we have equation eight because, and the reason I did that is because it equation eight is also using projections out by year. We've got the years over here, these values, these are um, emission factors for um, reactant organic gases, aka hydrocarbons, aka volatile organic carbons. Slight differences, mainly the same for our purposes here. That comes from light duty vehicles with a short wheelbase, the NOx from light duty vehicles with short wheelbase, PM 2.5 um, from the exhaust, PM 2.5 from tire wear, from brake wear. And then the same thing for light duty vehicles with the long wheelbase. Where these come from is not there. It comes from non-CO2 emission factors, EFs. 
So this table is from the US uh, EPA Office of Transportation. I got it from the um, from BTS.gov, is that the Bureau of Transportation Statistics or something like that? So got all these different vehicle types and the different types of emissions by year. And what you'll see is that they've projected out some of the years that we need into the future. And here I've extracted what this equation is that they're using to get these projections and use that to this tab to project out further. So these are just copied and pasted from that table. And then these are projections forward. But for ones that are really small, um, projecting them to almost zero and then a negative value didn't make sense. So I just took this really low value and kept it constant through time. So you can see that's for a couple of columns. And then with the um, improving emissions over time with the other ones, once they crossed zero and went into negative territory, I took the lowest value and copied that down for the remaining years as their emission factors. Um, so then you take the average, so you total for each vehicle type, and then you average those, and you divide them by 453, which is for converting grams to pounds, because for some reason the methodology as you report this in pounds of emissions. So now we have a per year emission factor for those vehicles. You also get, um, so that's pounds of emissions per year there. Because times, that's times the uh, difference in vehicle miles traveled there. And then we have emission factors for reduction in electricity use for some of those same, th same things. So VOCs, PM 2.5, um, that's from the electricity grid, from propane use, and then from natural gas, we have um, all those. And so we calculate um, into so we pull in the uh, amount of energy that a, an urban home uses in natural, in natural gas there. So then once we've populated all of these values um, and we don't have data for them over time, so we're not projecting them into the future, um, we then, we can look per year if we wanna look um, to see what the estimate is for all of these avoided non-greenhouse gas air pollutants. So we take the um, pounds of avoided emissions from reduced vehicle miles traveled, from reduced electricity use, from um, reduced propane use, and we kind of add those three terms together. Or, um, what I've done here in the equations tab is sum them here. So we're calling on that vehicle miles traveled part here, column V, which is right here. And then the second term is for the reduced electricity use. Um, so it's looking at the difference in electricity use, A55, A56, appears the difference between rural and urban times that emission factor times 30 years. This term doesn't have 30 years because it's a sum of 30 numbers. This one's just one that we take times 30 years. And then similar to that one, this third term is accounting for the reduced use of propane. And um, so we're taking the difference between uh, those two emission factors. 
between there. Well, it's not highlighting them, but the um, difference between um, the emission factors for um, natural gas and for propane. So it's this EFBL minus EFPR times the amount of natural gas used by an urban household. That's this term times 30 years, and we sum those together. To get the pounds of emissions across all the project years. I was kind of curious since everything else is being reported in tons. Um, I converted that to tons of emissions across 30 years. So that's a lot. Um, all the important numbers also show up here on the results tab. We also um, calculated some per acre per year, per household per year values. And then the agroforestry scenario across 30 years. Um, there's four scenarios. You can read about those in the report, but basically we looked um, in the Comet Farm uh, tool for uh, Bishop Farm, we estimated what are the uh, emissions happening now with um, the conventional corn soy cropping system. And it's about uh, 1,800 tons of CO2 emissions over the 30 years. Meaning that even if the farm doesn't improve its conservation and carbon sequestration in its practices, it's Avoiding conversion is still a net win for the climate, according to this estimate and the common farm estimate. Then if we have, we have these three kind of conservation scenarios. So one being we implement um, cover crops, no-till, we replace some of the nitrogen with an organic source, we add some um, compost. Um, so how did that change things? Both of these are happening on 65 acres turns it into a net carbon sink over 30 years. Then if we add alley cropping with black walnut, so that's going to take seven acres for the black walnut, 58 acres are in the crops. Um, that's going to be an even stronger carbon sink. And then thirdly, we have multi-practice conservation scenario, which includes alley cropping as well as a woodlot as well as a woodlot, riparian buffer, and three-row windbreak, and that's on 23 acres. So we've got 42 acres in crops, 23 acres of agroforestry, and um, over 30 years, that's uh, sequestering a little over 3,000 tons of CO2 equivalents, which is about a sixth of the estimated impact um, of avoided conversion on the farm site. So um, putting those all together, I think I will leave it at that. Thanks, and uh, if you have questions, feel free to reach out to me. My, I'm Bonnie McGill. My email address is bmcgill at farmland.org. That's B-M-C-G-I-L-L, -E -L -L, B-M-C-G-I-L-L -L at farmland.org. Thanks so much.